name is Scott Baker McGarva. I'm a retired fishing guide in British Columbia. Worked in the tackle trade my whole life in both retail and guiding, lodge management. You can pretty much say I'm a lifer. Now I'm a manufacturer's representative for many fine fishing brands under Woodside Agencies. Some of these brands include Sims, G. Loomis, Shimano, Abel, Ross, Airflow. I also do Waterworks Lampson and a Montana Fly through Gas Bay Fly Co. Uh, I'm here today to talk about reading water. And in my background as a steelhead guide for many years, you know, it was the number one question a lot of anglers would ask us when they're trying to learn to be better anglers was, how do I better read water? You know, what am I looking for? And what uh, should I be doing and where should I be uh, putting my efforts to be a better angler? And that's really important because rivers are big and there's a lot of people fish in a lot of spots that they're really just wasting their time that a little observation uh, would help them with. If you walk up to a piece of water for the very first time, it's good to stay back and look at it and you know, see where the cover is, see where the depth is. Uh, polarized glasses are invaluable in this. Uh, look for the drop-offs, the seams, boulders, structure, shade, the fish often, if you can see the fish. And, and that gives you an approach, uh, you know, or a, gives you the ability to develop your approach based on what you see. In fly fishing, we're always in a top-down uh, methodology. We're always starting at the top of the run and working to the bottom of the run. Uh, unlike conventional fishing where, you know, people walk to the middle, but I, I, my focus is top-down. I even think within traditional gear fishing, top-down, it's just an ethical thing to do. Start at the top, go to the bottom. If there's somebody in a run you want to fish, you start behind them at the top and you work your way to the bottom. Everybody gets their turn. So you, look, you walk up to a run and you're looking for basically three factors. You're looking for depth, speed, and cover. Uh, depth, of course, is where the fish can feel comfortable. Speed is where they're going to hold and rest or stage, but you know, resting fish is a much better fish to fish for versus a traveling fish. And finally, cover. Cover is a log, it's a rock, it's a overhang, it's shadows. Uh, just something that makes the fish feel comfortable. With an andromus fish, you know, they've come from the ocean and they're coming into a river environment that they were in as a juvenile and basically they're re-immersing themselves, but they're going to be a little freaked out because it's a lot different than the big ocean. Uh, in the situations where we fish for fish that are quite fresh out of the sea, it's actually surprising how shallow they'll sit. They'll sit in quite shallow, fast water. Not because they feel comfortable there, but it's security against predation. And so uh, a big river close to the ocean is not unusual to find seals in the river and predation has a big effect on where fish will hold. And, and it's quite surprising to some. People think the big deep spot is secure when in fact the shallow fast riffle is much more secure for a fish like a steelhead or a salmon that needs to escape a seal or a, or a sea lion. So when you're looking at the run, you first observe for those uh, characteristics, uh, depth, speed, and cover. And then you start at the top and you start to dissect the water. You say, I'm gonna start at the top, I'm gonna work through. Sometimes if the water close to shore looks good, I suggest that you maybe fish down the run on a short line first. You have way more control on a short line. Then go through a second time. There's not a big hurry. Way better off, take your time and be methodical. Break the water down into parts. Uh, too often people just randomly walk out into the water and start flailing for the far fence and, and it's not really a good methodology to, to approach the water. So start at the head, start short, work your way down and as you go look for these things in the water that you're fishing. It's always important also to really recognize speed when you feel it. One thing I learned when I was a conventional steelhead angler uh, was how to find right, the right speed of water by staring at my float. Uh, in British Columbia where we are, you know, a lot of guys float fish for steelhead and a lot of people cut their teeth float fishing for steelhead and have learned to catch steelhead on conventional gear long before they've taken up the fly rod. Uh, and the one thing conventional gear will really teach you, particularly float fishing, is water speed. 
you think water is kind of fast, you throw a float over there, now you have a small visual indicator to follow. All of a sudden, that water is not half as fast as you thought it was. Fly swinging is the same thing. You throw a fly in a piece of water, let it sink, starts to swing through. You can almost telegraph that really nice cherry piece of water. It's got this nice walking speed to it. You can almost feel that there's going to be a fish there. And many times I've experienced where I felt like, oh, this feels really good right in here. And yank, you get a pull or you get a fish. Or I've had a client get a fish. I've almost been able to call it when I can see the line just walking through that spot that, you know, there's a good opportunity for a fish or a fish takes and climbs on. So that's something that's really beneficial about fishing with floats and uh, to some degree indicators. Although I'll make fun of you if you fish indicators for steelhead, but uh, you can you can you can look at that. And frankly, most of the really good fly fishermen I've ever read about or known about started conventional fishing, and then they float. They started to fly fish at a much later time. Uh, fortunately, back in the old days, there was also way more fish to catch. So to switch to fly might you know if your if your game is numbers, then maybe fly fishing isn't for you. But anyway, okay. In this particular piece of water that we're looking at. We're going to break this down into the three components that you can see in front of us. We have a big tail out here, and the tail out breaks and goes over into some pocket water. And then from the pocket water, it goes down and breaks into a flat with some obstructions and some cover. And the flat is more suitable fly water. So you've got some fly water in the top, some water more suitable to conventional in the middle. So in this particular tail out we're looking at, we're not going to fish this. We can see that it's quite broad. A lot of gravel, limited structure. We can see where the fish aren't. <laughs> so we're just going to drop down here to those two pieces of water down below. You see that upper uh, pocket type water, a little deeper and faster, more oriented to gear or conventional fishing. And then that lower flat down there, which is more suitable fly water. This first piece of water is an obstruction based pocket. Not really suitable to fly fishing because the pocket is created by the wood and it causes a lot of turbulence and it'd be very difficult for you to get a fly in there. However, this type of water will hold steelhead because it provides a current break for the fish. And the steelhead will sit in there quite easily. For an example of how slow the current actually is in that bucket, we're going to use this float fishing setup and throw a float in there and you can see the float and you'll see how it just walks through that bucket nice and slowly. It's not half as quick as it looks. So what I have here is a classic BC pink rubber worm with a center pin reel and a float. And we're just going to put this in the bucket and you're going to see that the water is much slower than you imagine. Or rather, you're going to see that the water is actually a lot slower than it looks. So right in there, nice and slow, starts to pick up speed, pull it out. You would not fish that with a fly very effectively. However, it would be a good example of how an obstruction causing a break in the current provides an adequate place for a fish to hold. See the float just slowly goes through there. Has a little bit more turbulence than I would like. And a bit higher water would probably not be a holding spot. So now we're going to go down to the bottom of this flat to where there's some more suitable fly fishing water and we'll talk about that when we get down there. Okay, this next spot is much more fly friendly. It's more even speed, it has some current obstructions which slow the current down, and it's a nice depth for fly fishing. Now the obstructions come off the far bank. It's important to note the first thing is that one of them is wood, and the other three are big boulders. Big boulders are very fly friendly, you can slide a fly by them. Wood, not so much. So what we want to do is get above the obstruction, throw the fly across in front of it, 
and try to swing the flight as near the obstruction as we can to allow it to get into the current brake that's behind it. And in this case, it's the central line down the run, or what they call the fellwig of the run, the central current running through the run. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to throw the fly to the far bank, mend, drop some line into it, and try to feed that fly right down the center line of this run. No grab, strip it in. Okay, now we're gonna do a second cast, a little further in, over to the far bank, so we can drop it into where we think the fish are. Everybody's gonna expect the fish. Now, as we move down the run, we're going to continue to try to drop or fly as close to the obstruction as we can to swing it into that nice soft water behind it, and in this case, under the overhanging branches on the far side. Another good indicator of current speed is the foam line that typically comes off a rock or an obstruction in mid-current. If we look on the far side there, we see that the foam is coming off the log and you can look at the foam to judge the speed of the current. Similar to throwing a float in the water or an indicator, the foam relates to you that the water is much slower on that far edge of that current than it is on the near edge of the current. So that fast meets slow current line, as transmitted to us by the foam, is a perfect place for fish to sit. Fish do not want to work if they don't have to. They want to sit where the softer current makes it easy for them to rest, but they can escape into the faster current at a moment's notice. So trying to find those fast, slow seams is always a key to finding spots where fish will hold. Again, you're trying to drop your fly just on the soft water, throw some slack, Get that fly to drop in as quickly as possible and then walk it down through that current seam where the fast meets the slow water. As you get further down the run, the transition between fast and slow becomes less noticeable and is more gradual. So typically, fish will lay along that fast, slow current seam as far down the run as the depth will allow. So as long as we have depth and speed and the current change, fish will find it comfortable and should sit there. So as we get down this run into the back, the current is starting to spread out more evenly across the back end of the run. The fish can start to lay anywhere. There's no specific place they would sit because there's no specific current change or any specific obstruction. If there was to be a rock or something that was noticeable, I would focus my energy on that because that kind of current break is really common. Well, I'd focus my energy on that because that's somewhere where fish will like to hold. In this case, I'm just gonna cover the water in a grid type pattern and step each cast through it. So you're working down that line, step, cast, cast, step, whatever you prefer you get to the tail of the run. But what's important is fish through the run, then fish through the run again. If, if you feel you didn't really cover it, you may be not deep enough, change your sink tip, go through it again. Uh, this is an important part of learning water. The more fish you catch, the more experience you gain, the more experience you gain, the more confident you feel. Uh, no amount of instruction will ever replace good experience. So if you can get on the water and fish through and, and understand what they like, what you'll discover after a while in steelheading is you'll start to have a repertoire of spots that have all those features that you're looking for, of depth, speed, and cover, and you'll rotate them. You'll fish it through, you go to the next one. Fish it through, you go to the next one. 
and sure later you're going to catch a fish. Oh, dog's coming. To the structure, you want to throw it up onto the flat uh, above the structure and kind of let it drop into the lip and then down into where you think the fish are going to hold. So you're starting high. In this case, we're throwing pretty far across and straight across so that we can man get the fly a chance to sink quickly and then run it through and then just step down through the run. Just about every cast is going to hit the far bank right out of the gate because I can tell that there's not much benefit fishing short first. When you fish ahead of a run, you always want to start with just your leader, then your tip, then your head, and then work out some line and to work through. In this case, I can see I don't need to do that. I'm going to right away go for the juice, which is to put it right over above the structure and drop into where I think the fish will hold in these rocks. Dropping it in, mending, dropping some line into it. Even step it down a couple times as it swings into the spot. Once you think you know where you are, fish-wise, you just let it swing through. Drop your rod, follow the swing. When you read what's really important to understand fly speed. And the speed the fly is moving through there is really relevant. In the winter time, you want it deep and slow. In the summer time, you can get away with a little quicker. Fish are more aggressive. Dropping it in, take a couple steps as it sinks, help it get down quickly. As it gets in the bucket, drop your rod with it. Let it swing, swing out. I don't really bother with a big hang down because I can see once it swings out of the color change, it's over the gravel and I don't anticipate a fish would bother chasing it. The fish are going to be right in the corner, right off the drop-off. Every cast is just dropping in on that far bank, dropping into the rocks there, feed it through, getting down. So on these high banks, as the current leaves the bank, you have a pocket on against the high bank. So up top here the water is very close or the water is very fast close to shore. As we get down it starts to move away from the bank and it leaves a soft spot right tight to shore. So if I was on that other side that would be right at my feet. And if I was fishing from the other side I would then cast across and swing right into the hang down and really let the fly hang below me because that's relevant. That's where the fish are great in a clear river because you can really see where to put your time. When you're reading water and you're trying to see what's going on, starting with clear rivers really helps you understand things. It's amazing how many casts it would take to a fish to get them to move to a fly. Or how many different types of mends it took to get the right men to get the fly in there. So when you think you're really in a bucket, it pays to really throw a bunch of different approaches at it. Just pretend there's a fish there and just keep throwing different men's, different sink rates. Oh, it's a little bump there. A little, bit of a hair trigger. Uh, once you get through the middle of the run, you know, you're typically getting to tailouts. And tailouts uh, are usually nice, big, broad, open pieces of water. And those kind of water, pieces of water are a favorite amongst fly fishermen because they're just so nice. It's so easy to present your fly and get that nice smooth swing. And in a lot of rivers where you have a long stretch of fast water, a tailout is the first soft water the fish lie, lies in and therefore rests uh, above that, that heavy water. So basically he's come up through the rapid, pulls into the tailout and they'll stop and they'll sit right on the lip of the tailout. 
uh, there is a rule of thumb, but when you think you've fished into the tailout far enough, fish another 10 feet. Another 10 feet of line, swing through the tailout. You'll be amazed how many steelhead will sit right on the very lip of a run. And uh, nothing worse than fishing through a tailout and going back to your boat or waiting that tailout to go across the river and kicking up a fish in the, in the very tailout that you missed. That'll always remind you to fish a little deeper in the tailout. So with, within that realm, you always have to consider other factors uh, in the water that you want to approach. Uh, apart from speed, depth, and cover, water temperature is important. In early season steelhead fishing, when the water is quite warm and oxygen levels change or are lower, in warmer, the fish will seek out faster moving water. Fresh fish will sit in faster water. As the water cools, the fish start to seek out deeper, slower water. Uh, typically. Uh, winter steelhead fishing, the fish are looking for uh, a lot softer, slower current speed and more cover than say summertime fishing or summer run fishing or fall fishing. It's all temperature related. And that affects your approach with your tackle. Obviously if you're fishing in summer runs or fall run fishing with a fly, you know, floating line and uh, light sink tips and dry flies, all that stuff is very relevant and that's really the way you want to fish. Winter time fishing or cold water fishing and I should emphasize that. Now you got to get that fly deeper. The fish are more sullen. They're less inclined to move to a fly. They're going to sit in deeper water. So all these factors contribute to your approach. You want to look at the water and go, okay, I'm fishing winter runs. They're going to be in that kind of water. I'm going to need to fish a heavier fly, heavier tip, fish slower, and dig it down into those fish. Summertime fish with floating lines, uh, the fish come to the fly much better, you fish through much quicker because the fish are going to come to you much more readily. So knowing the time of year, the fish you're pursuing and everything else is going to have a big approach, uh, or rather a big change to your approach. It's also important to note that we don't catch fish hand over fist. Fishing, steelhead fishing in particular, is a patient game and knowing that you're hitting the right spots and fishing the right way and cycling through water and moving on to no water means at the end of the day you'll feel that you fish that water well. And if you fish good water well, you can go home feeling that you did everything right and whether or not you caught a fish is a secondary uh, part of the equation. Obviously we like to catch fish, but we like to know that we did the best job possible and the rest is up to the fish. Uh, before I embarked on my rep career. Uh, I guided steelhead in BC both summer and winter and fall run fish. Uh, spent many many seasons on the Dean River, Maurice River, Babine River, Bulky River, Yakun, Stamp, Squamish, Chequemus, you know a lot of different water and, and a variety of seasons and, and obviously summer fall is sort of the classic fly fishing season but a lot of winter run seasons. You really work for your fish in the winter just because of the cold conditions. Uh, spring run conditions where uh, the water's warming and the fish are coming in uh, before uh, freshet. And all these different things kind of gave me a pretty broad uh, experience level as far as what we expected out of uh, water conditions and fish and places to look for fish, how the fish behave. Uh, you're dealing with fish that are both fresh in fish, uh, migrating fish, staging fish, or resting fish and pre-spawn and then of course you're leaving them alone when they're spawning. Uh, but in all of this, you know, the number one thing I've discovered about understanding where fish will sit is water speed. Is Where's the speed that suits the fish? Whether it's shallow, fast, deep or slow, water speed is the key I find in finding where you're going to find steelhead laying uh, when you apply it to the time of year and where they're going to be. Fancy word there, Thelwig. 
cover. The cover in this case are uh, the cover in this case 